Uh, it's really great. Um, Cozy is, ha, has been one of those pieces that for many, many years we've been thinking about trying to do. Uh, it's a very difficult opera to do. You know, it's, it's, it's sometimes, you know, it's a default opera, you know, when companies say, oh, well, let's do a Cozy, it's easy. It really is. It's really not. And, and to be able to find a cast like this, which is like the gold standard, I have to tell you, it's amazing singing. Uh, and I'd like to introduce, first of all, our soprano, Jacqueline Wagner. Here. And so soprano singing Dorabella is Jennifer Holloway. Matt Worth is our baritone, Bulgaria. Welcome back, John Tessier. Tessier. I don't know if he'll be changing clothes in this show. <laughs> Singing high seas and taking off your clothes. It was quite a feat from last year, John Antelope. And uh, welcoming back, Danny Mobbs. And our wonderful Despina from our Resonance program, Angela, Angela Morgan. Um, and it's such a pleasure to welcome back uh, Christopher Franklin, who is mm -hmm. conducting this show. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, a, it's such a really terrific pleasure to welcome back Peter Rothstein, who worked with us some years ago and has now gone on to create great things here in the Twin Cities and around the country. Uh, and this is his first production, his first sort of whole new production with Minnesota Opera, Peter Rothstein. <laughs> I feel weird I walked through this door as a chorus boy, so it's just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they um, But um, I love this piece. And when we started, Alexander Dodgson here today as a scenic designer, I was really interested in exploring not just the, the battle between two different ideologies, one body in a Don Alfonso, or the intellect, the head, and our lovers embodied by the heart, but possibly a bigger discourse around uh, human beings' desire to control nature, represented by the lovers and their need for constancy, and Don Alfonso and its need for man to supersede nature. We're coming out of the reign of Louis XIV, our sun king, and so this idea of man above nature is alive and well. So I said to Alexander, what might be the four elements of nature and how would they work into our world? Alexander had just seen, we can actually click and start on this here. Uh, Alexander had just been to an exhibit in New York of a man who um, grafts all sorts of different trees together, creating his own breed of plants. And um, he was at the Arbor in New York, and, um, and it was quite contemporary in its aesthetics. And there were this fiberglass boxes of earth and dirt, and then these man-made trees that lived inside of them. And we were both drawn to that image and this idea of man controlling nature. So, I knew I needed the world to move quickly from inside to outside, and so we decided we would have a room that uh, was filled with grass, and um, and uh, that elements of nature appear throughout the production. The production actually begins with Don Alfonso lighting a cigarette, so fire gets us going, first element. Fire uh, reoccurs throughout the production, uh, following that opening moment, uh, there's a parade of Minions, Don Alfonso has eight men at his disposal to change scenery. Uh, and there's a great. Uh, <laughs> I worked at Danny Set of Morris. Seven wasn't enough. <laughs> so, uh, 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 but there's a stream of water that uh, runs through the middle of this room that comes and goes throughout our evening. So, through the overture, it begins with this moment of Don Alfonso lighting a cigarette, which then triggers a parade of men carrying lanterns, which get hung in a tree for our tavern scene. Uh, in Act Two, we'll see there's a moment where fire ends up being the moment of Dorabella's fall um, as kind of the ultimate passion and, and romance. Um, Earth is alive and well in our grass floor, inside this tree structure, uh, and elements of water. <coughs> That we'll see both in the stream, um, and we'll see water reoccur as an icon throughout throughout our evening, uh, and then the most important element, wind, which is re represented through the human the human 
voice. Uh, and ultimately, nature wins. It trumps all of them. It trumps the lovers. It trumps Don Alfonso. Uh, so we actually begin at the bare stage, and then the tree is omnipresent, and then we move into our tavern scene. I was interested in also shifting locations freely and more often than maybe the opera called for. So uh, as those who know the libretto well, there's not a lot that's dictated as far as specificity of place, nor specificity of action, which can make the four hours really tricky to figure out how to keep physical. So most of the scenery came from an idea of um, this perfect day in the life of these girls, and what would their perfect day look like, and how do they try to maintain that perfect day um, despite this curveball that's thrown at them, or a number of curveballs that are thrown at them. So I was interested in exploring the idea of constancy or fidelity in gender, which um, is going to be tapped into ideas that I think are alive and well today. I still think we have different expectations around men and women and the expectations of fidelity and loyalty, um, certainly around, uh, around the globe, but I think it's even alive and well in our country. Uh, and we'll see, it as we go to some of the costumes, how we manifest that idea of um, gender oh, expectations around. So, um, so we move from the tavern to, um, to a street with moonlight, um, and then we move to the girls' garden, uh, to swings, uh, and we live here um, until the boat arrives, calling the men to war. And so a boat <laughs> Um, I didn't talk about this kind of catwalk structure that lives above the stage as well as these trusses. So that's Don Alfonso's world. Uh, Don Alfonso has a different kind of set of theatrical rules than the other characters. He's the mastermind of the theatrical event. But ultimately, even he is, he is trucked by nature, which we'll see. Uh, the chorus all live up on that catwalk for the military choruses. Um, and the boys get you, you don't get in the boat. <laughs> <laughs> you have finger puppets. <laughs> uh, and then the boys leave, and we go to the girls, um, oh, not here. We go to the girls' breakfast room, um, where Justina serves them breakfast again, trying to continue on with this perfect day. I think Dora is uh, throwing her food across the room in dismay. Uh, and we go then from a breakfast room to the game room where the girls try to carry on a game of cards despite these curveballs that are thrown at them, and then back to the garden uh, where we end Act 1. Uh, act 2 begins in the girls' vanity. We see them in their, um, their underwear and, uh, and robes as they prepare to dress for dinner. <laughs> Again, so they can do push-ups at intermission and then <laughs> in their underwear. Uh, and we go from the vanity then to what we're calling the magic garden. Um, Sixteen choristers bring on very large lanterns that are suspended um, throughout the space. I, I felt like this scene wanted that garden of Versailles, kind of um, mazes throughout the garden, and sight line wise that's a little tricky, so uh, lanterns was our, our solution there. So this lives all the way through Fredelici's, um, you know, Miss Maria. <laughs> and then we go from the Magic Garden to a sitting room. Um, and this is where Fredelici is ultimately wooed and caged in. The, the ginormous uh, painting is actually a light box, so it will illuminate, again, this idea of man putting nature inside of a, a frame, controlling, controlling nature. And we go from the sitting room to the Great Hall and ultimately a rainstorm at the end um, that trumps even Don Alfonso. So, it rained on stage, yeah. So, and in this moment, actually, all of the catwalk and the truss structure above the stage will elevate and lift away. So Don Alfonso is even trumped in the end and ultimately, ultimately rain wins. Um, my partner's from Mexico, and he has, there's a saying in Mexico that if it rains on your wedding day, it's because the bride is the only sunshine uh, for that day, and I, I love that idea. But when I was trying to navigate the end of this thing, after you know spending three plus hours with these people, what's ultimately different at the end? So it doesn't feel pat and easy, but that each character is ultimately changed and transformed. And 
Uh, we looked at, especially in the clothes, this idea of women that I think we still do today. We condition them that the wedding is their most important day of their life and that it will be perfect. And these Disney images of princesses uh, leading to that day are alive and well in our culture. And I wanted the ultimate moment to be <clears throat> one of liberation, not necessarily one of constancy. So that the wedding is not saying you will feel today the way you the way you feel today is how you should feel forever and always, which is where these characters begin the play. Which I think, if all of us are honest about the human heart, that's not our life experience. Um, and that raining on the wedding day is actually an ultimate um, liberating act, where that ideal perfect wedding is destroyed. But in that is freedom, liberation, joy, and a much stronger metaphor for what it means to weather the storm and trust the human heart um, throughout life's curveballs. So the final moment is this downpour of rain. How wet you get is yet to be. <laughs> Don Alfonso carries an umbrella the whole play, actually. <laughs> so, um, so you're good. But <laughs> we'll see. Um, Alejo Diaz is our wonderful costume designer, and I'll let him tell you about all the things. mostly part of a 19th century, that's very romantic period with a big group skirt, but we brought in much more to 2011, and we took a lot from fashion. Uh, it's chill, you know, girls will be corseted, so uh, we still have a little bit of a, a period flavor, but I think we want to uh, accentuate it with like a much more modern look to it. Let's pass, uh, this is like research images, I mean, we that we use as this part of like modern classicism in a way that is very pretty. I mean, that's even like a Dior dress from like the 50s actually. This is a much more than Galliano take on it. So let's, it's Alexander McQueen. <laughs> 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 uh, and, and that's kind of the inspiration that we use for the um, men uniform for the show. Um, we, well, that's Lord Byron actually in a <laughs> traditional Albanian, this is a real traditional Albanian uh, costume and that's what we use as a base for our version of the Albanian costume. Uh, that's the research for Don Alfonso. Okay. Nice. <laughs> Which is the research for the spinner. There you go. Oh, the color is really, really off. Yeah. Actually, there's no color in it. <laughs> well, this is pink. <laughs> <laughs> we'll probably will see like better uh, versions of it. So this is like the idea of like uh, Fiordelici and Dorabella at the beginning uh, and like what we call the day dresses. And um, there's you know, the light, we make sure that the undergarments are very light, so they're kind of romantic and playful at the same time. And they play with the stripes, both of them, but we don't see much of that here. Okay, let's move on to, and that's like the undergarments. I mean, if you remember that first slide that we saw of the Shivanshi gown with the pink coat, that was the inspiration for the robe, and the McQueen was the inspiration for the robe. But this is completely made in organza, so it's very see-through, the whole thing. At the course, so no worries. <laughs> <laughs> then they change into the evening gowns. Both of these are like fully beaded uh, teal taffetas. Yes. And there's, it's a lavender and a blue, in case you don't see the color. And again, they, take, they, they keep the romanticism of the 19th century, but it has a much more fashion, <coughs> modern take to it. Next. And this is the wedding gowns for so-called wedding gowns, which are um, very romantic and very princess-like, and although they will be beautiful, they will, make, they will be made fully in polyester in case they get wet. <laughs> <laughs> and they have a wonderful detail on the back. I don't know if we have that sketch from the back. No. No, we don't. Okay, but they have really wonderful like, <laughs> flowers and detail, one in pale blue and one in pale pink to reminisce the tribe of the tower. This, well, this got a little bit of color. <laughs> this is a, a idea for the uniform for Ferrand and Guillermo, and the idea is like, they will keep the breeches, the riding breeches, very form-fitting, and, and riding boots, and they will add the robes and turbans, and, and there will be red silk and a lot of gold embroidery, too, and the mustache <laughs> over here. For the Albanian. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we changed it. <laughs> 
She will always wear, um, oh, there you are, uh, pants, uh, like little cigarette pants, and a corset, black as well, that she'll, she'll be able to take off this costume and put on the disguises mm -hmm. for the lawyer. And there you go, the there doctor, go. the lawyer. So that's kind of the idea for what I'm there. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> last, last night, last night, so Peter loves glasses. He wears glasses. So he calls me. He's like, "Oh my God, in the sketches, you forgot to put on the glasses." So thank you, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, Alex makes his wonderful improvised version of glasses. Do it magically, call me. Let's move to the next one. Uh, oh well, this is a game in color, is it? Uh, but this is like the, the idea for the chorus. Your chorus uh, will be always the same palette, it will be all gray, like mm -hmm. medium grays, and nobody will be in the same costume, so they all will be somehow individual, but they will be cohesive because we're keeping the palette very, very contained in the warm grays. So that's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah. of Cosi Fan Tutte, and this is going to sound very superficial, but for me I think one of the most difficult things to solve um, is what happens in the end. Because um, as a conductor you have uh, the score, you know, which is like your Bible, where everything is pretty much outlined. But it's not clear really what happens. I mean, they don't really say, you know, if it, if it were a, a, an opera buffa, uh, or if it were a tragedy, there would be like some huge um, death or, or a tragic event and the whole opera would build up into, into that moment and also dramatically for me it would be easy to, to, to organize the evening in that sense. If it were opera buffa there would be uh, you know some resolution at the end like a happy ending maybe a marriage and so everybody would just live happily ever after. Uh, there is a, a wedding in Così Fantute at the beginning of the Act 2 finale after which the whole thing just sort of disintegrates and, and, and breaks down. Then you have this weird little moral tacked on the end, which is basically, you know, happy is he who lives on the right side of life, which is kind of a slap in the face after everything's happened uh, throughout the course of the evening. So, um, you, know, you could argue that if the couples get back together with their original partners, everybody have a lot of explaining to do, obviously, but um, uh, certain moments in the piece would have to be played in a certain way. And if those same partners maybe are, 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 are end up with their new uh, uh, suitors or whatever, those same moments need to be played just a little bit differently. You could also argue that way. You could also say, and I've been involved in productions where nobody ends up with anybody and it's all a big mess and you see these characters years down the line and they're all in rehab or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and in that sense, I think this opera is probably the most contemporary of, um, of Mozart's operas. Contemporary in terms of content and subject, uh, not in terms of music. And it's surely one of the reasons why it's, it's probably the least understood, and it's probably one of the reasons why during the 19th century it was pushed to the fringes of the repertoire. It was probably viewed as something practically immoral, you know, that we don't want anybody near. So um, when I started talking with Peter on, on, on Skype, because Skype is famous for me, which is a good thing, one of the first things he said to me was, um, and I wanted to, you know, I was, I was ecstatic that he said that because he said, you know, the problem with Cosi Van Tutte is it's often pigeonholed as some sort of a cheap uh, opera buffa, and it's and it's and it's, and it's and the direction the directors take is usually the wrong one, and um, that was such a great relief to me because oftentimes, uh, you know, people try to jam this opera into the buffa pigeonhole, and it doesn't really fit in there because it's so much more than that. There's some very emotionally deep moments, and there is some there are some funny moments as well. But um, I think that's one of also the, the, the 
most the most difficult uh, interpretive uh, question to solve when you're mounting this piece. Um, so for, for me, when I when I heard these singers also yesterday, because oftentimes now, you know, of course, you want to do is oftentimes now sort of these little baroque voices and can be very very fast. And I was just talking with Dale about the fact that, that this opera needs to be a voluptuous opera. And so when I heard these voices yesterday, I was ecstatic because we have we have here a cast that's really great singers, and it's going to be such a joy to work with them this month and mount this production. So uh, we have a good time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.